AP Bio Unit 6 Gene Expression. If you're getting ready for the AP Bio exam or for a comprehensive Unit 6 test, and you're looking at a diagram like this, which shows production of RNA, modification of RNA into mRNA, and then translation of mRNA into protein, and you're thinking, this is complex stuff, then don't worry. That's completely reasonable. It is complex stuff. And what this video is gonna do is help you get ready for both the AP Bio exam and that Unit 6 test. Here's what this video is gonna cover. DNA and RNA structure and function, DNA replication, transcription, translation and the genetic code, regulation of gene expression in prokaryotes, which is about operons, eukaryotic gene expression, mutation and horizontal gene transfer, and biotechnology. I'm Glenn Wolkenfeld, also known as Mr. W. I'm a retired AP Biology teacher, and I love teaching B-I-O-L-O-G-Y. When I taught AP Bio, most of my students got fours and fives on the AP Bio exam, and this video is designed to help you do the same. One of my keys to success as an AP Bio teacher was my use of the interactive AP Biology curriculum learn-biology.com, which I wrote for my own students to help them succeed. I'm anxious to share it with you. Please sign up at learn-biology.com slash AP Biology. Topic 6.1, DNA and RNA structure. Here are some of the questions that we'll be addressing. Describe the structure and function of DNA and RNA. Compare and contrast how prokaryotic and eukaryotic DNA is organized. What is a plasmid? Describe the structure of DNA. DNA is a double-stranded helical molecule composed of nucleotide monomers. In this flattened out representation of DNA, here's one strand, here's the other strand. In this helical representation, you can see one strand, another strand. Because there's two strands, it's a double helix. The monomers are nucleotides. They consist of a five-carbon sugar called deoxyribose, hence deoxyribonucleic acid, a phosphate group, and one of four nitrogenous bases. So it doesn't have to have this exact structure. It can vary over here in terms of the nitrogenous base. Each strand consists of covalently bonded deoxyribose sugars and phosphate groups, which comprise DNA's sugar phosphate backbone. Within the helix, bases with complementary shapes bind through hydrogen bonds. Thymine is complementary to adenine. Guanine is complementary to cytosine. In the case of adenine and thymine, you can see the hydrogen bonds that form between the oxygen over here, the hydrogen over here, hydrogen over here, nitrogen over here. The bonding follows base pairing rules that you have to commit to memory. Adenine binds only with thymine, A binds with T. Guanine binds only with cytosine, G binds with C. For the nucleotides to bind, they have to be oriented upside down relative to one another, making the two strands anti-parallel. This strand has its five prime end over here, its three prime end down here, and this strand is the opposite, anti-parallel, like this. Explain how DNA's structure allows it to serve as the molecule of heredity. We'll start with information storage. The four bases can occur in any order, I've represented them over here as A, C, T, G over and over again to show the structure, but there could be three A's in a row, followed by two C's, followed by a T, followed by whatever. The sequence isn't determined by DNA's chemistry. That allows the sequence to be an informational code that specifies sequences of RNA and protein. Replicability. The specific base pairing, A, T, GC that we talked about previously allows each strand to serve as a template for the synthesis of a complementary strand during DNA replication, which we'll talk about in a moment. That also ensures high fidelity transmission of genetic information from parent cells to daughter cells. DNA is highly stable. Its double helical structure protects the sequence of bases that are inside but while it's stable, it's also capable of mutation. Mutability is the fourth characteristic. There's a low level of mutation where bases can change from one to another, either spontaneously or caused by mutation-causing factors in the environment, 
and that allows for change in this code, which allows for evolution. Compare and contrast the functions of DNA and RNA. DNA is the molecule of heredity in all organisms. Anything that is cell-based life, which is all life, has DNA as its molecule of heredity, as the stuff that genes are made of. RNA is the hereditary molecule in some, but not all, viruses. Viruses that you might know about that are RNA-based include HIV and SARS, a form of which just caused the COVID-19 pandemic. In all organisms, RNA is involved in information transfer related to protein synthesis, how DNA becomes RNA and how RNA becomes proteins. And that includes forms of RNA such as mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. In eukaryotes, RNA is also involved in the regulation of gene expression. And this previews some topics that we'll talk about later in this unit that includes splicing out introns non-coding DNA from pre-mRNA to create mRNA, and regulating protein synthesis. Compare and contrast how genetic information is stored in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes store their DNA in looped circular chromosomes. In other words, the beginning and the end is connected. It's sometimes described as circular, but looped is really more accurate. The genomes of bacteria and archaea range from about 100,000 base pairs to 10 million base pairs. And their DNA is naked. It's not wrapped around a protein scaffold. In eukaryotes, the DNA is organized into multiple linear chromosomes. So there's one end and there's another end. And the DNA is wrapped around these proteins that are called histones. Eukaryotic genomes are much larger than prokaryotic genomes. The human genome, as one example, consists of 3.2 billion base pairs, but there are some plant genomes that consist of 150 billion base pairs. What are plasmids? What's their function? How are they used in genetic engineering? Plasmids are small, extra chromosomal loops of DNA, commonly found in bacteria, less commonly in archaea, rarely in eukaryotes. Here's the main bacterial chromosome. These loops, also made of DNA, are the plasmids. They're involved in horizontal gene transfer between bacterial cells through a process called conjugation. These transfer genes, because they're transferring DNA, that codes for protein, from one cell to another, they're often for antibiotic resistance. Plasmids are commonly used in genetic engineering as a vector for replicating DNA and for expressing engineered genes within bacterial cells. Both horizontal gene transfer and genetic engineering are going to be covered later in Unit 6. Topic 6.2, DNA replication. Some of the questions we'll be addressing. Why is DNA replication described as semi-conservative? What are the key enzymes involved in DNA replication and what do they do? What's the difference between DNA replication at the leading and lagging strands? What are Okazaki fragments? On a big picture level, describe how DNA replication occurs and what the term semi-conservative means. During DNA replication, a team of enzymes using each strand of the double helix as a template synthesizes new daughter strand. Here's the original strand. Enzymes pull that strand apart and that results in two daughter strands that are each single strands. These single strands serve as a template. And what that means is that nucleotides that are available in the nucleus following the base pairing rules will bind with the exposed strand. A will bind with T, C will bind with G, etc. The result is that each daughter DNA double helix consists of one conserved strand from the parent molecule and another strand that was synthesized anew. In these daughter molecules, one of the strands is this strand. Here we go. The other strand is this strand, whereas these strands over here are new, semi-conservative. One strand is conserved, the other strand is new. You can see that represented here with a kind of color coding where the parent strand has both strands colored red, and you can see in the daughter strands, one strand is red, conserved, one strand is orange, new. 
That method of replication is known as semi-conservative replication. Describe how DNA replication starts. In the model of DNA replication that we're about to talk about, there's a lot of simplification compared to how the process actually works in nature, but don't worry, this is exactly what you need to know for AP Biology. The process begins when an enzyme called helicase over here at B finds a sequence called the origin of replication that basically says start replicating here and separates the double-stranded DNA as you know, that means breaking the hydrogen bonds that are holding the two strands together. This exposes two single strands and it creates a structure that's called a replication fork. Describe the roles of DNA polymerase, primase, and primers in replication. Let's get oriented here before we start. This is a replication fork this is DNA helicase that's opening up the parent strand, exposing the nucleotides in the two daughter strands. DNA polymerase is this enzyme shown over here and over here. It's the key enzyme involved in creating new DNA. The parent DNA is shown in dark blue. The new DNA that's coming in is represented in light blue. The nucleotides bind based on base pairing rules. DNA polymerase doesn't know which nucleotide should fit. The knowledge is basically in the template strands. So if there is a C over here, then a G will bind. If there's an A over here, then a T will bind. What DNA polymerase does is it binds new nucleotides to the three prime end of a growing strand, and that's a sugar phosphate bond. DNA polymerase has a limitation. It can only add nucleotides to an existing strand. So think of it as an enzyme and it has an active site. Its substrate is the pre-existing strand and the new nucleotide that came in. So to start the process, DNA polymerase needs an RNA primer, a couple of bases of RNA that DNA polymerase can start connecting DNA nucleotides to. Here's the primer shown over here here it's shown and it's represented by number four. There's another enzyme that can come to an open replication fork and start laying down that primer and that's represented here at five. It's called primase. Primase lays down the primer. What role do single strand binding proteins play during replication? The single strand binding proteins are shown at eight. And what they do is they keep the double helix from rewinding so that all of these other enzymes can get into place and carry out replication. How is DNA replication at the leading strand different from replication at the lagging strand? In each replication fork, there's going to be a leading strand and a lagging strand. In the leading strand, which is shown over here at J, DNA replication is relatively continuous because DNA polymerase at G is following the opening replication fork that's being created by helicase over here. In the lagging strand, which is shown at L, DNA polymerase synthesizes in the opposite direction from the opening replication fork. So what you have to imagine is that DNA helicase opens up the helix a little bit, DNA polymerase gets in and starts synthesizing, and then it opens up a little bit more well, DNA polymerase can't go in this direction. It can only go in the five to three direction. So that means another DNA polymerase comes in and synthesizes this over here, and yet another. And each time there's a primer. What that means is that on the lagging strand, DNA replication is discontinuous, and it's built from short sequences that are called Okasaki fragments, named after the researchers who discovered that this is how the process works. Describe the roles of DNA polymerase one and ligase during DNA replication. DNA polymerase one, shown over here at K, removes the RNA primers. Here's one over here. Here's a whole bunch over here. And it replaces the RNA with DNA. Another enzyme called DNA ligase is required to finish the process and create the complete daughter strands. What it does is it seals the gaps between fragments with sugar phosphate bonds. Topic 6.3, transcription. 
Here are some of the questions that we'll be addressing. Explain the overall flow of genetic information within cells. What are the principal forms of RNA and what is the function of each? Explain what happens during transcription. Explain the overall flow of genetic information within cells. This is the central dogma of molecular genetics, which is DNA makes RNA makes protein. Information flows from a sequence of DNA triplets to a sequence of mRNA codons to a sequence of amino acids. What is a gene? If you've been following this series, we looked at this slide in Unit 5, but now let's look at it again in the context of molecular genetics. A gene is the basic unit of heredity passed from parent to offspring. It determines a trait. In terms of molecular genetics, it's a sequence of DNA nucleotides that codes for RNA, which codes for protein. List the principal forms of RNA and describe the function of each one. mRNA, or messenger RNA, is a linear molecule and it brings instructions from DNA to ribosomes. RNA, ribosomal RNA, makes up the catalytic part of ribosomes and binds amino acids together during protein synthesis. Ribosomes are these particles that are composed of rRNA and protein. We'll look at them in depth later, but they're essentially enzymes, and they're the enzymes that bind amino acids together during protein synthesis. tRNAs, transfer RNA, bring specific amino acid to the ribosomes, again, for protein synthesis. Small RNAs are a large group of RNAs of different shapes and sizes, and they're involved in eukaryotic gene regulation. What happens during transcription? Transcription is the creation of RNA, which we see over here in blue, from DNA. Every gene begins with a promoter region that indicates that that's where the gene starts. And during transcription, an enzyme called RNA polymerase binds with the promoter on DNA. Then it transcribes the sequence of DNA bases on DNA's template strand into a sequence of RNA. RNA polymerase, like all of the enzymes involved in working with DNA, reads the DNA in the three prime to five prime direction and synthesizes new RNA in the five prime to three prime direction. And when the RNA polymerase reaches a terminator region, which is at the end of the gene, it dissociates from the DNA ending transcription. Define and describe template strand, minus strand, non-coding strand, or anti-sense strand in relationship to RNA transcription. The template strand, it's this one over here in blue, it's also called the non-coding strand, the anti-sense strand, and the minus strand. That's what gets transcribed from DNA into RNA. The complementary strand to the template strand is called the coding strand. Why? Because you can see that it has the same sequence of nucleotides as the mRNA will. Here's the coding strand, G-G-T-T-A-A. -A. Here's the RNA that's being produced. G, G, U, U, U substitutes for T in RNA, A, A. So G, G, U, U, A, A, G, G, T, T, A, A. It's the same. Why is it the same? Because it was created in response to this template strand over here. That's why the coding strand is called the sense strand or the positive strand. What are some unique features of prokaryotic transcription? Prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. There's no separation between the genetic material and the cytoplasm. As a result, in prokaryotes, transcribed RNA, which is shown here at D, can immediately be translated by ribosomes into protein. And that's what you see as these strands over here. Often, multiple ribosomes read the same RNA strand these multiple ribosomes are sometimes called polysomes, and you can see them in a more zoomed-in version over here. The genetic code and translation slash protein synthesis. Here are some of the questions that we'll be addressing. What is the genetic code and how does it work? 
What are the key molecules and structures involved in protein synthesis? Describe the process of protein synthesis. What is the genetic code? How do you read a genetic code chart? Use the code to translate AUG, GUC, AAG, GUU into protein. The genetic code is the code used by living things to translate nucleotide sequences into amino acid sequences. We've talked about how DNA makes RNA makes protein. DNA to RNA is transcription. Now we're going to get from RNA to protein. In the genetic code, groups of three RNA nucleotides, so like for example, AUG, GUC, they're called a codon and they code for one amino acid. Codon, code one. The code is nearly universal. Nearly every living thing uses it in exactly this way. There are some minor exceptions. It's specific. Every codon can determine one amino acid, but it's redundant. There are synonymous codons. AUG, GUC, AAG, GUU codes for methionine, valine, lysine, valine. How did I do that? Here's how you use the code. A U G. This is the first nucleotide in the RNA codon. This is the second nucleotide in the RNA codon, and this is the third. So you work from the inside out. A U G codes for methionine. G U C codes for valine. A A G codes for lysine, and G U U codes for valine. So we can see how G U C and G U U are synonymous, and that's an important relationship. Often the first two nucleotides are more important than the third one, and ones that have the same two first nucleotides are often synonymous. Use the genetic code dictionary below to code out C U C. GAU, GCA, GUC, CGU. The code that we looked at on the previous slide is a circular code. I actually think it's easier to use, though you'll frequently see codes like this that are tabular. In this code, the first base is represented on this column, the second nucleotide base is represented over here, and the third is going to be one of these four. Let's demonstrate how that's used. C U C is the first codon. C U, and here's C, that codes for leucine. G A U, G is the first base, A is the second base, U codes for asparagine. G C A, G C A codes for alanine. G U C, G U C codes for valine and CGU, C, G, U codes for arginine. Here you see all of the amino acids and their corresponding codons represented here. What's the big picture of translation? Who are the key players? mRNA is shown over here at G2. It contains the codons this group over here, AUG, or this AUG, or this CCG, that specify the order of amino acids. Here are amino acids shown over here. The ribosome connects amino acids to create a polypeptide. Ribosome is represented as K, and what it does is it'll connect, for example, this amino acid, proline, to this growing chain of amino acids. A chain of amino acids is also referred to as a polypeptide. Remember, that's the first level of protein structure, the linear sequence of amino acids. tRNAs are shown over here at letter O. Here's a tRNA. And tRNAs bring amino acids, such as this one over here, to this ribosome mRNA complex tRNAs have an anticodon, such as this over here, GGG, letter H, and an amino acid binding site over here. In the next slides, we'll put the entire process together step by step. 
What is the role of the ribosome in translation? What are the key parts of ribosomes to know? Ribosomes are general purpose protein factories. They can take any mRNA, which is what brings it information, and convert it into any sequence of amino acids. They're the enzymes that string together amino acids to form polypeptides, and they do that following the instructions in mRNA. They have a large and a small subunit, and they have three tRNA binding sites. The E is the exit site. That's where the tRNA that's given up its amino acid will leave from. The P site holds the polypeptide, and the new amino acid comes into the A site. Describe how translation protein synthesis begins. Processed mRNA, that means mRNA that's ready to be translated, that doesn't have any introns in it, leaves the nucleus. It'll leave through a nuclear pore. The small ribosomal subunit will bind with the mRNA and make its way over to the start codon, which is AUG. That's where translation begins. That small subunit then waits, quote unquote, for a tRNA with a matching anticodon to bind with the start codon. So this tRNA has the anticodon UAC, which complements AUG. This first tRNA is carrying the first amino acid, methionine. Then the large subunit binds with the small subunit. The ribosome is now complete. And that first tRNA with methionine is located in the ribosome's P site. That's the middle binding site. Describe the elongation phase of translation. The next tRNA comes to the A site and it bears a new amino acid. Here it is. The ribosome then catalyzes a peptide bond between the P and A site amino acids. So here's a peptide bond that's forming between methionine and valine. Then the ribosome translocates. It moves over one more codon. So that means that a dipeptide is now hanging off the P site amino acid. The A site is empty, and there's a tRNA in the E site, but it's not connected to the polypeptide. It's not connected to any amino acid. Now what happens is that the tRNA that's in the E site exits. The new tRNA enters at the A site. The A site's empty over here. A new tRNA comes in. The ribosome is going to catalyze a bond between that new amino acid and the existing dipeptide. So there's going to be a tripeptide that's temporarily at the A site, but the process is going to continue. It will be another round of translocation followed by exit, followed by another tRNA that's charged with an amino acid coming in, followed by another peptide bond happening. And that continues along the entire length of the mRNA. Describe the termination phase of translation. The ribosome gets to a stop codon. The stop codons in the genetic code have no corresponding tRNA. Instead, what they do is they code for a release factor. That's a protein that can bind with the stop codon and induce certain changes in the mRNA, tRNA, ribosome complex. And those changes cause the ribosome to dissociate and the polypeptide to be released. The only thing that needs to happen now is for this polypeptide to fold up into a functional protein. Translation is done. At learn-biology.com, we understand why students struggle with AP Bio. It's a hard course, but we have a plan for your success. Go to learn-biology.com, sign up for a free trial, and complete our interactive tutorials and interactive AP Bio exam reviews. We guarantee you a four or a five on the AP Bio exam. See you on learn-biology.com. Topic 6.5 to 6.6, .6, Regulation of Gene Expression, Part 1, Operons. Here are some of the questions we'll be addressing. What are operons? What's the difference between an inducible and a repressible operon? How does the trip operon work? Explain how the LAC operon works. Let's start with a little context. E. coli is a bacterial cell that lives in our colons that 
coli is related to colon, and it also lives in the colons of many other animals. The colon is the large intestine. E. coli has about 4,000 genes. This is a chromosome map of E. coli's chromosome, and it shows a small portion of these 4,000 genes, which code for a variety of proteins. The overall genome of E. coli consists of about 4 million base pairs, A, T's, C's, and G's. And this leads to a question of regulation, which is what's the control system for turning its genes on and off? Let's start by responding to this very general question, what is an operon? One definition is that an operon is a cluster of genes transcribed as a single RNA. Here we have a portion of DNA that's labeled structural genes, and it's all transcribed as one RNA transcript, but then that RNA is processed so that it's producing a variety of enzymes. A cluster of genes transcribed as a single RNA. But our focus in AP Biology is that an operon is a mostly prokaryotic system of gene regulation that has control elements that allow for gene regulation. Describe the structure of an operon. Here we see a string of DNA, and it's an operon. It consists of structural genes, and those are genes that code for protein. There's an operator, which is where a repressor protein binds, and that enables this system to be regulated. There's a promoter where RNA polymerase binds, and there's a regulatory gene that produces the regulatory protein. That regulatory protein is generally a repressor protein that binds at the operator. How does the trip operon work? The tripoperon is a system that codes for a series of enzymes that make tryptophan. That's what the structural genes do. These enzymes work as part of a metabolic pathway that codes for tryptophan, which is one of the 20 amino acids. But it's also a regulatory system that only turns on production of these enzymes at certain moments. If there's no tryptophan in the environment, then the regulatory protein over here, which is produced by the regulatory gene, and that's pretty much always on, that can't bind with the operator. Look at the shape of this regulatory protein over here, and notice that this part won't bind with this. And really what we're talking about is a protein with a complex shape that can actually bind with a sequence of DNA, because that's what the operator is, it's DNA. That means that RNA polymerase can bind at the promoter, and it can roll down the length of the gene and transcribe the structural genes, creating these enzymes. When tryptophan is in E. coli's environment, that tryptophan, the amino acid, will diffuse into the cell. What will happen? When tryptophan is in the cell's environment, then what will happen is it'll bind with the repressor protein. And when it does, that will cause the repressor protein to change shape. Think of this like an enzyme that's doing an allosteric shift. Binding over here causes a chain over here. How and why? This is a protein that has alpha helices and pleated sheets, and it's very dynamic. So the binding over here causes a change over here. That enables this regulatory protein, a repressor, to bind with the operator. When it does, it blocks RNA polymerase. That means that RNA polymerase can no longer transcribe these structural genes to make enzymes that synthesize tryptophan. That makes a lot of sense. The basic rule is if tryptophan is present, don't make it. It's an adaptation for saving energy. TRIP is therefore called a repressible operon, and tryptophan is the co-repressor. This protein, when it binds with tryptophan, blocks the operator, repressing the system. Transcription becomes impossible. That's the TRIP operon. How does the LAC operon work? We just looked at the TRIP operon, which controls the synthesis of enzymes for synthesizing tryptophan. What about this LAC operon? 
LAC operon is an inducible operon, as opposed to TRIP, which was a repressible one, and it codes for enzymes that digest lactose, a disaccharide. So here's lactose. You can see it's composed of two sugar monomers, and the enzymes that digest lactose will break it down into glucose and galactose. What happens when lactose is in the environment? Remember, these bacteria live inside our guts. So if you had E. coli in your gut and you drank a glass of milk, the sugar in the milk, which is lactose, would then be in the environment of E. coli. That lactose will diffuse into E. coli. Once lactose is inside E. coli, it binds with a repressor protein. Here's lactose, it's binding with a repressor protein, and notice the effect. In this case, the lactose causes the repressor protein to change shape so it can't bind with the operator. That keeps the operator free, and when RNA polymerase binds at the promoter, it can roll down the length of the operon, it can transcribe the structural genes, and those structural genes produce enzymes that break down lactose into monosaccharides and also increase the permeability of E. coli cell membrane so that more lactose can enter. When lactose is absent, however, there's no lactose available to bind with the repressor. The repressor's default shape lets it bind with the operator. RNA polymerase, therefore, after binding with the promoter, can't transcribe the structural genes. The rule is if lactose is absent, don't make genes to digest it. Again, think of this as a metabolic adaptation. This saves energy. Don't make enzymes to digest something when the thing that you're digesting isn't around. LAC is therefore an inducible operon. It can be induced to be turned on. What turns it on? Lactose. Lactose is the inducer. The LAC operon is a negative feedback system. Explain. Think about how the LAC operon works. Lactose turns the system on. Turning the system on removes lactose from the system. Why? Because turning the system on, allowing RNA polymerase to transcribe these genes, allows for the production of enzymes and proteins that enhance lactose digestion. That enhanced lactose digestion will make all of this lactose go away. When all of this lactose goes away, there'll be no more lactose to bind with the repressor, which will then bind with the operator. The result is that the system turns off, and that's negative feedback, where the output of the system has the effect of quieting or repressing the system. You can say the same thing about the TRIP operon. It's also a negative feedback system. Why? The absence of tryptophan starts transcription. When tryptophan is not in the environment, then the regulatory protein can't bind with the operator. That enables RNA polymerase to transcribe these structural genes, producing these enzymes that are part of the metabolic pathway to produce tryptophan. That produces tryptophan, and the production of tryptophan puts tryptophan at high enough concentration in the cell so that it binds with the repressor protein, changing its shape, allowing the repressor protein to bind at the operator, shutting down transcription. That turns the system off. That's also negative feedback. Both TRIP and LAC negative feedback systems, even though LAC is an inducible system and TRIP is a repressible system. The graph below shows the growth of an E. coli culture that's fed with both glucose and lactose. X and Y show the glucose and lactose concentrations. So note how the glucose concentration is going down over here, and notice that the lactose concentration maintains itself and then goes down over here. The red line shows the growth of the bacteria over nine hours. There are two lags in growth. One is at B over here between A and C, and the other one is here at D. What's happening? E. coli prefers to metabolize glucose. Why? Because glucose is a monosaccharide, 
Lactose is a disaccharide, and as you know, glucose is the fuel that goes right into the glycolysis process that begins cellular respiration. Now, up to point A, E. coli eats glucose and grows rapidly, but then the glucose starts to run out. As the glucose starts to run out, there's a lag in growth during activation of the LAC operon and lactose digesting enzymes. From C to D, the LAC operon is churning out those enzymes that break down lactose into glucose and galactose. But at a certain point, lactose runs out and then there's another lag, which might be a permanent lag, until another food source is introduced into the culture. The key idea is that glucose is easier to digest than lactose. Glucose will be metabolized, it'll be digested first, followed by lactose. There was a graph like this that was an FRQ on one of the previous tests. And this is why you have to understand operons in order to succeed in AP biology. Regulation of gene expression part two, eukaryotic gene regulation. Here are some of the questions we'll be addressing. What are acetylation and methylation? And why is eukaryotic gene regulation so complex? What is pre-mRNA? Describe some of the post-transcriptional modification that has to happen to pre-mRNA and eukaryotes before it can be translated into protein. Explain how the organization of eukaryotic genetic material into introns and exons can increase phenotypic variation. Gene regulation in multicellular eukaryotes, key issues. Organisms like you, and me, and lizards, and redwood trees, and jellyfish, any multicellular eukaryote is composed of trillions of cells organized into specialized tissues. We have 46 chromosomes, 3 billion base pairs in each haploid genome, and 20,000 genes. Gene regulation is a big and complex issue. Here are some more parts of that issue. Every single cell has the same DNA, but cells need to know which genes to express as they develop. And gene regulation, as we just saw with prokaryotes and operons, is also influenced by factors in the environment. How do genes get turned on and off? Note that most eukaryotic DNA is non-coding. So what's the difference between the coding DNA and the non-coding DNA? And genes contain introns. We've mentioned these before. Now we'll really look at them in depth. In eukaryotic cells, what determines which genes are expressed? Let's start with this fact. In any cell in a multicellular organism, most of the DNA is not expressed. You have cells that make up the lens of your eye. Those cells express a single protein. That means that 19,900 something other proteins are not being expressed. All those genes are turned off. Those genes that are turned off are tightly packaged around proteins that are called histones. That's what these disks over here represent. There's an additional chemical modification, which is called methylation. It's the addition of a methyl group that carbon attached to three hydrogens, and that prevents transcription. In the few genes within any cell that are turned on, there's a process called acetylation that loosens up the DNA, and that makes it possible for RNA polymerase to come in, find the promoter, and transcribe the genes. What is epigenetics? We just talked about how in most cells, most of the DNA is not transcribed. It's silenced, it's turned off. Only a small number of genes are turned on. What's the difference? That is all defined by this newly emerging topic that's called epigenetics. Epigenetics are changes in DNA expression that involve reversible chemical modifications of DNA or modifications in DNA packaging. Chemical modifications of DNA, methylation. Modification in DNA packaging, wrapping around these proteins that are called histones. 
but the genes themselves, the sequence of nucleotides, is not changed. It's a level above the genetic level. That's why it's called epigenetics. It's responsible for the differentiation of tissues during development. Why are skin cells expressing skin proteins where fingernail cells are expressing fingernail proteins and muscle cells expressing muscle proteins? Those are all about epigenetics because all of those cells contain the same genes. Somewhat astonishingly, sometimes these changes can be transmitted from one generation to the next. That's a newly emerging field of study, and that's intergenerational transmission of epigenetic modifications of the genome. What's the connection between epigenetics, cell differentiation, and gene expression? The key idea, one that needs to be memorized, is that all cells in the same organism are genomically equivalent. Every cell in your body, except for your gametes, has the same DNA. All cells are descended from the zygote. That's shown at number one in this diagram. All cells have the same DNA. That's shown at three and four. Cells differentiate because they express different genes, and that relates to the epigenetic modifications that we just talked about in the previous slide. Describe on a big picture level how transcription is regulated in eukaryotes and eukaryotic cells. Previously, we talked about operons, which is how genes can be turned on and off in response to environmental changes. Eukaryotes have to be able to do that too. Some of that relates to acetylation, methylation, histones, the things we've talked about, but some of this is on a more immediate regulatory level. So let's look at the regulatory processes that occur in eukaryotes. Eukaryotes possess regulatory DNA sequences that interact with regulatory proteins to control transcription. I know that this diagram looks horrifyingly complex, but you really only need to know it on a basic level so you can understand questions that might come your way on unit tests or on the AP bio exam. Some of these regulatory sequences include promoters. We've talked about those in the context of transcription. So there are promoters shown at letter E. There are also enhancers that are shown at letter A. And what they do is they increase the probability that a gene will be transcribed. They enhance that possibility. Interactions between activator proteins, they're shown at B. DNA bending proteins, that's at F mediator proteins at G, and general transcription factors, H, enable RNA polymerase, shown at letter I, to bind, making transcription possible. All you really need to know is that this kind of system is one that's used for eukaryotic gene regulation. You'd never be asked to differentiate between these mediator proteins at G and these general transcription factors. You just need to know the big picture. This is what eukaryotic gene regulation can look like. How can gene expression be coordinated in different body tissues? During development, as we've discussed, different tissues express different genes. But those different tissues can also share common regulatory sequences that enable the transcription of genes within those various tissues to be coordinated. An example of that is that the tissue in a male lion's neck skin, I'm talking about this over here, and their muscle tissue express different genes. One's expressing the hair that makes up the mane, and the other is expressing the tissue in the muscle. But both of those tissues share a common testosterone receptor gene. That testosterone receptor gene gets expressed as a cytoplasmic receptor, and therefore when testosterone gets released into the body, it binds with the testosterone receptor. This becomes a transcription factor that goes into the nucleus and activates genes. The genes that are activated are going to be different depending on whether those cells are in the lion's neck or in the lion's muscle tissue. But that leads a single hormone, in this case, to be able to induce changes in different tissues. It's coordination of gene expression in different body tissues. What are introns, exons, 
What's required to make translatable mRNA in eukaryotes? Introns are intervening sequences of DNA within genes. They are transcribed into pre-mRNA. Here's an intron in DNA. Here's an intron in pre-mRNA. Exons are DNA that becomes RNA that ultimately becomes mRNA that gets expressed into protein. It gets translated into protein. And that is just a bit of the processing of pre-mRNA that has to happen in eukaryotes. Here's the process of transcription, relatively straightforward. But then what we need to have happen is all of these introns need to be cut out. And then the mRNA needs some modification so that it can survive in the cytoplasm and be translated by a ribosome into protein. We'll see that in a couple of slides. Describe some of the post-transcriptional modification that has to happen to pre-mRNA in eukaryotes before it can be translated into protein. In eukaryotic cells, pre-mRNA is what's transcribed from a protein coding gene. So this is DNA over here. You can tell because it's a double helix. And this is pre-mRNA, right over here at number two. Before it can be translated into protein, that pre-mRNA has to be processed in several ways. It has to get an addition at its five prime end of a GTP cap and a three prime poly A tail. Poly A tail, it just means it's adenine, 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 adenine all over again. As we've discussed previously, introns, those intervening sequences that don't code for protein, need to be excised. They need to be cut out. And then the fragments that consist of the exons need to be spliced together. Then you wind up with mRNA that can be translated into protein. What is the function of the five prime GTP cap and the three prime poly A tail that's added to mRNA during eukaryotic RNA processing? That five prime GTP cap, which is shown over here at G, protects the mRNA from breakdown by enzymes in the cytoplasm. And it also assists the mRNA in leaving the nucleus and binding with a ribosome. The three prime poly A tail shown over here, that makes the mRNA more stable and it delays its enzymatic breakdown by enzymes that are in the cytoplasm. Explain how the organization of eukaryotic genetic material into introns and exons can increase phenotypic variation. As we've discussed before, exons are expressed sequences. They're translated into amino acid sequences. Introns are intervening sequences that are spliced out of mRNA before translation. Here we have DNA and here we have pre-mRNA. And what we've got to do is we've got to cut out these introns. But in eukaryotes, there's a process called alternative splicing. Through alternative splicing, exons can be spliced together in alternative ways, allowing for the production of multiple protein versions from the same pre-mRNA transcript. So for example, in this mRNA and in this protein, what we've done is we've dropped out a couple of the exons. There's exon one, three, four, and six. Here's another version of the same protein, exon one, two, five, and six. And here's yet another one, exon one, two, four, five, and six. The basic idea is that each of these exons codes for what's called a functional domain, a piece of the protein that can actually do something. You put those functional domains together and you get proteins with slightly different functions. They're all within the same close family. They're all from the same gene, but they're different manifestations of those genes and they provide for additional phenotypic variation that's found in eukaryotes, but it doesn't happen in prokaryotes who don't have the intron exon organization of their coding genes. Explain the role of small RNAs in eukaryotic gene regulation. Small RNAs are exactly what they sound like. They're segments of RNA that don't consist of a huge number of nucleotides, yet they play important regulatory roles in the cell. 
One of these is microRNAs. MicroRNAs are particularly small, and they play a role in what's called post-transcriptional control of gene expression. That's exactly what it sounds like. It's after transcription. A key process that microRNAs are involved in is called RNA silencing. Here's how it works. Here's DNA. That DNA will contain a gene that codes for a microRNA. Not all genes code for proteins. Some of them just code for RNAs. In the same way as pre-mRNA needs to be processed before it matures, there is processing of the pre-microRNA to make it into mature microRNA. In the same way as ribosomal RNA will connect with protein, this microRNA will connect with a protein that's called an RNA silencing complex protein. Together, that RNA plus the RNA silencing complex protein will do one of two things. If the microRNA completely matches 100% part of a sequence within an mRNA, then that complex will cause the mRNA to be degraded and destroyed. If, on the other hand, there's a partial match, then this complex will cause a pause in translation. In either case, what have we done? We've changed expression of a gene through microRNA. Are you asking yourself, how am I gonna get a four or a five on the AP Bio exam? It's a good question because it's a hard test, but we have a plan for your success. Go to learn-biology.com, sign up for a free trial, and complete our interactive tutorials and interactive AP Bio exam reviews. We guarantee you a four or a five on the AP Bio exam. See you on learn-biology.com. Topic 6.7, part one, mutation. Here are some of the questions that we'll be addressing. What is a mutation? What's a point mutation? Distinguish between silent mutations, nonsense mutations, and missense mutations. Mutations can be positive, negative, or neutral. Explain. What is a mutation? What's a point mutation? A mutation is a random change in DNA or an entire chromosome. A point mutation is a change in a single nucleotide. You see that here with the nucleotide C mutating to the nucleotide T. Distinguish between silent mutations, nonsense mutations, and missense mutations. Silent mutations are mutations that result in the same amino acid being coded for. The DNA changes, but the amino acid in the protein doesn't. Why? Because the genetic code is redundant, with many codons coding for the same amino acid. A nonsense mutation is a mutation that inserts a stop codon instead of an amino acid. And a missense mutation changes the amino acid from one to another. We see a silent mutation over here. The original DNA is lysine. The DNA that's now being coded for despite this mutation is lysine. Here's a nonsense mutation where instead of lysine, we have a stop codon. And here we have missense mutations. One is coding for arginine instead of lysine, and one is coding for threonine. The effect of a missense mutation depends on the chemistry of the substitution. This isn't a term that you need to know, but a conservative missense mutation is one where the chemistry is of less significance. So lysine is a basic amino acid. It has this amino group over here at the end, and so does arginine. So that might not change the structure of the protein very much. It might not change it in a functional way that is really observable in a phenotype. It's not clear, but it might not be a big deal. On the other hand, substituting threonine, which is a nonpolar amino acid for lysine, would be a big deal. This is nonpolar. This is basic. That's a very significant change in chemistry, and that will impact the function of the protein. What are frame shift mutations? To review this concept, I've put together a sentence composed of three letter words. There are no spaces, but we have these little dividers here. If we were to do a mutation where we did a substitution of E for A over here, 
then note that most of the words still make sense. We have the cat. What's a cat? Well, you could probably surmise that that was intended to be cat and that it's just a typo. But if we deleted one of the letters, like hitting the delete key on your keyboard, then what we get is if we drop this A over here, then essentially we've significantly changed the meaning. We have one word that makes sense in so far as it's a word, but it doesn't make sense in the context over here. That is called a frame shift mutation because codons are read in groups of three. If you delete or insert, you change the reading frame. Now let's look at some nucleotides. Here is a series of codons that code for four amino acids and then a stop codon. And note that this example shows RNA to show the consequences. The mutation would have been in the DNA. If we have a frame shift mutation, then what we've done is we've done a deletion or an insertion that changes the reading frame just like we did over here. And that will cause extensive missense or nonsense. Deleting this U over here causes these two amino acids to be wrong. That's missense. Or what can happen is you can have the insertion of a stop codon and then the entire protein doesn't get coded for after this first amino acid. That is the impact of a frame shift mutation. Sickle cell disease is caused by a single substitution mutation. Explain how one such substitution can cause sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is one of the first genetic diseases that was understood well on a molecular level. It's important to know about. The disease involves changes in the protein hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, shown over here, is a quaternary protein that carries oxygen in red blood cells. So here's hemoglobin in red blood cells, and here the red blood cells are carrying oxygen, delivering it to the tissues of the body. The mutation that causes sickle cell disease is a missense mutation, and the eighth DNA triplet mutates from GAG to CTC, and that causes valine, which is nonpolar, to substitute for glutamic acid. That causes a significant change in the chemistry of hemoglobin. It causes hemoglobin molecules to stick together. So notice how over here, they're separate within the red blood cell, but the mutated form, they'll form very weak bonds. And that happens under low oxygen conditions. That just means when you exercise or walk up a flight of stairs, anything like that, that causes the cells to become sickled or spiked, and they get stuck in red blood cells, and that causes extensive tissue damage. This is a recessive mutation, you need to be homozygous in order to express the phenotype. That there is a phenotype that is caused by being a heterozygote, that's called sickle cell trait. In any case, this is how a single substitution mutation can be responsible for a significant genetic disease. Mutations can be positive, negative, or neutral. Explain. The big idea is that a mutation's effect always depends on the environment. It's contextual. A positive mutation improves the phenotype in a way that increases evolutionary fitness. Fitness is about survival and reproduction. If it increases both of those things, then it's a positive mutation. Here's an example. This is a kind of fish that's called a three-spine stickleback. There are populations that live in oceans. There are populations that live in freshwater. Note this pelvic spine over here. It's an adaptation that promotes survival in marine environments because it protects against certain kinds of predators. There are populations of sticklebacks that became stranded in freshwater lakes. In those populations, the predators were absent. There was a mutation that emerged that resulted in the loss of that pelvic spine not only because it doesn't make sense to produce a structure that has no survival benefit, but there are predators that actually can prey on sticklebacks with the pelvic spine. So losing the pelvic spine, positive mutation. We just talked about sickle cell anemia. 
that's uh, in most cases a mutation that reduces fitness. Why? Because it causes diseased red blood cells and it causes tissue damage as we just explained. However, in the context in which the mutation for sickle cell anemia evolved, in some ways it's a positive mutation. Why? Because having one dose of the sickle cell allele, in other words, being a heterozygote, gives you resistance to malaria. So that makes it a positive mutation in a malaria-ridden area. In that context, it's positive. A neutral mutation has no effect on the phenotype, and that's because it might happen in non-coding or non-regulatory DNA, or it might result in a silent mutation where the amino acid doesn't change. How are mutations important to evolution? Mutations provide the raw material upon which natural selection acts. Note that I'm using the same illustration as in the previous slide, and I'm doing that on purpose. Mutation makes evolution a creative process that results in adaptation. Without mutation, natural selection could only cull harmful variants from a population. But with mutation, new variants can arise that increase a population's fitness. What's the difference between germline and somatic mutations? Germline mutations are mutations in the cells that make gametes and all other cells. Here's sperm, here's an egg. If there were a mutation in either one, then that mutation would be present in every cell in the embryo. That means it would be present in every cell in the organism and it would be present in the gametes that that organism produced. Germline mutations can be inherited. They're subject to natural selection. And what's an example? Any inherited genetic disease, such as sickle cell anemia, which we have discussed, or every adaptation. A somatic mutation, it emerges in some tissue during the course of development or during the course of adult life. It only affects the organism. It's not passed on to the future. And an example are, the somatic mutations that can cause cancer. Topic 6.7, part two, horizontal gene transfer. Here are some of the questions we'll be addressing. Contrast horizontal gene transfer with vertical gene transfer. Describe bacterial transformation, bacterial conjugation, and viral transduction. What is viral recombination? Contrast horizontal gene transfer with vertical gene transfer. In vertical gene transfer, parents transmit all or half of their genome to their offspring. That's what's happening here. Here's a bacterium, it's reproducing, and in this generation, all of the genes have been transmitted, and in the next generation, all of the genes have been transmitted. You inherited your genes from your parents through vertical gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer is quite different. In horizontal gene transfer, one organism transfers genes to another organism that is not its offspring. That's what we see happening down here. This bacterium over here is transferring genes on this loop of DNA to this second bacterium. In unicellular recipients, as is shown here, the newly acquired genes become part of the recipient's genome, and when this bacterium reproduces, it'll pass on the newly acquired genes to its offspring. In a multicellular recipient, there's only long-lasting results, intergenerational results, if the genes are transferred into the germline. Describe bacterial conjugation. If you want to build your vocabulary or use your vocabulary to enhance your understanding of biology, conjugation is another word for sex. Here's how it works. It's unlike any kind of sex that human beings or other animals have. Bacteria have, in addition to their main chromosome, main chromosome over here, they have a loop of DNA that's called a plasmid. 
plasmids can express genes for a membrane extension that's called a pilus that's shown over here at C. When the pilus contacts a second cell, the plasmid can be copied and transmitted to that recipient. And the recipient now has all of the genes that are on the plasmid. We have horizontal gene transfer. Conjugation plays a key role in the spread of antibiotic resistant genes through bacterial populations. Describe bacterial transformation. In bacterial transformation, bacteria pick up DNA fragments, shown over here at one, from the environment. And those DNA fragments enter into the cell and then become incorporated into the genome. That's what's shown over here. This DNA can include plasmids. So here's a circularized piece of DNA, a plasmid that's being incorporated into the cell. In genetic engineering, transformation using plasmids is used to introduce foreign genes, including human genes, into bacterial cells. Describe how horizontal gene transfer can occur through viral transduction. Transduction is a kind of horizontal gene transfer that occurs through viruses. It occurs through mistakes in the viral replication cycle. During viral infections, the virus breaks apart the host's genome. Here's a virus, it's injecting its DNA into its victim, this cell over here. And one of the first things that happens is that the cell that was infected has its DNA broken apart. What the virus then does is it uses the cell's molecular machinery to create new viral genes and to produce new viral proteins. And those become assembled into new viral particles. But during a mistake in the process, sometimes DNA fragments from the host over here are mistakenly incorporated into a virus. So this virus over here is leaving the cell carrying genes from the host. It should just be carrying its own genes. When that virus infects a cell in another organism, another bacterial cell in this case, it can bring in the other organism's DNA. So here's the DNA from the original host, and notice that DNA is being injected into this new host. That DNA will recombine with the DNA that's in the new host, and this can happen to animals as well. And if the virus infects a germline cell, the new genes can be incorporated into the gene pool of the recipient. What is viral recombination? This is a kind of horizontal gene transfer that occurs within viruses. In this case, two different viruses, different strains of different viruses, infect the same host. So this virus and this virus, they're variants of one another. And here you see them infecting a new host. And here you see both of these viruses inside a cell from the host. As they carry out their replication cycle, there's DNA from the host, there's DNA from the viruses, and the DNA from the viruses can get mixed up. So the genes of the viruses can recombine, and the result is instant emergence of new viral strains. Sometimes, if animal immune systems can't recognize the new strain, this can lead to pandemic viral outbreaks. This is what happens when every couple of years there is a strain of the flu that's new and that's novel and which infects many people, sometimes with disastrous results. This kind of viral recombination is what causes it. Is AP Bio making you feel overwhelmed and inadequate? That's completely reasonable. At learn-biology.com, we understand why students struggle with AP Bio. The material is complex, the pace is brutal, and the vocabulary is ridiculous. But at learn-biology.com, we've created a way that makes it easier for you to study. Go to learn-biology.com, sign up for a free trial, and complete our interactive tutorials and interactive AP Bio exam reviews. We guarantee you a four or a five on the AP Bio exam. See you on learn-biology.com. Topic 6.8, biotechnology. Here are some of the questions that we'll be addressing. What is recombinant DNA? How can it be artificially created? How can you create recombinant bacterial plasmids that can express human genes? What is gel electrophoresis? What is PCR? What is sequencing? 
Explain what recombinant DNA is and how it can be artificially created. Recombinant DNA is DNA that's been combined from more than one source. During meiosis, you would create recombinant DNA as you combine the DNA that you inherited from your parents in the form of new gametes. But this is artificial recombinant DNA. It's DNA from more than one source shown over here that might have bacterial DNA with a snippet of human DNA with more bacterial DNA. So DNA artificially combined more than one source, it's been recombined. The main tool in creating recombinant DNA is something called a restriction enzyme shown over here at letter C. What these restriction enzymes do is they find sequences of DNA that are called restriction sites. So here's one at B and they cut the DNA. Here's the DNA with sticky ends. And you can see these sticky ends over here. Those sticky ends are exposed single strands of nucleotides you see that over here in this diagram that shows the DNA double helix. And those single strands are able to form hydrogen bonds with complementary bases. The result of using a restriction enzyme shown over here, shown over here, are restriction fragments. So here's a fragment over here, here's another fragment over here. If you cut a second piece of DNA, for example, a piece of human DNA with the same restriction enzymes, what you'll wind up having are complementary sticky ends. Because of complementarity, the ends of the two pieces will form hydrogen bonds. That's what you see happening over here. And then you need to use another enzyme, it's called DNA ligase, and that creates sugar phosphate bonds connecting the strands, creating recombinant DNA. Using restriction enzymes and DNA ligase, you can create a recombinant plasmid with a human gene. Explain how. Note for this question, assume that introns have already been removed from the human DNA. The first step is to extract a plasmid from a bacterial cell and then cut open that plasmid with restriction enzyme, leaving sticky ends the way that we just described in the previous slide. Use the same restriction enzyme to cut out a target human gene and therefore the ends will be complementary. Because they've been cut with the same restriction enzymes, the human gene will combine with the plasmid, forming hydrogen bonds between their complementary sticky ends. Then you have to use DNA ligase, we referred to that in the previous slide, it's not shown here, to bind the human DNA and plasma DNA together, creating a recombinant plasmid that contains a human gene. Then you'd insert the plasmid into a bacterial cell. That's using the technique of transformation, which we previously referred to when we talked about horizontal gene transfer. This genetically engineered recombinant bacteria, this over here and its descendants over here, will produce the human protein and produce the plasmid in every reproduction cycle. This is how genetically engineered insulin has been created. That means bacterial cells that produce a human protein that's widely used. In order for the genes for human proteins, such as insulin, to be expressed in bacteria, introns need to be removed. Explain why and how. To review, Introns are non-coding sequences of DNA within eukaryotic genes that have to be spliced out before the gene's RNA can be translated into protein. Here's human DNA. There are exons that are expressed sequences, and they're separated from one another by introns, these intervening sequences. The consequence of the presence of introns is that to transfer a human gene to a bacterium to create a gene product, you have to use DNA from which the introns had been removed. The bacteria would just translate everything, including the introns, and that would lead to a non-functional protein. How do you remove the introns? You have to do it before transforming the bacterial cells, and you can do it in two ways. The first method involves determining the amino acid sequence for the protein. Biochemists can look at a protein like insulin and figure out what the linear sequence of amino acids is. Once you do that, you use your genetic code chart to reverse engineer DNA that codes for that amino acid sequence. 
Another method is shown here. What you do is you find cells that produce the desired protein, you extract mRNA from those cells that codes for this protein. That mRNA already has had its introns removed, and then you use the enzyme reverse transcriptase. That's an enzyme that's in retroviruses, which are viruses that are RNA-based but can create a DNA copy of themselves that gets incorporated into the human cell that they've infected. HIV is an example of one such virus. You use reverse transcriptase, which is shown here at B, to create cDNA complementary DNA from the RNA, and then you insert that complementary DNA into the plasmid, and that's how you do your successful genetic engineering. What is gel electrophoresis? How is it used to analyze DNA? Gel electrophoresis is a technique that's widely used. It's used to sort molecules by size and or electrical charge. It's the basis of a technique that's called restriction fragment analysis, also called DNA fingerprinting, widely used in forensics. It involves placing molecules in a porous gel. Here's the gel over here at number five. That is in a device, an apparatus, a box, that can produce an electrical current. So you'd run an electrical current generated over here through the gel. Because DNA's phosphate groups, shown over here, are negatively charged, DNA fragments will move away from the negatively charged side of the electrophoresis chamber. So you put the DNA over here, like repels like, negative charge, negative charge, and that's gonna push the DNA in this direction. The small fragments will be impeded by the gel less than the large fragments. So over time, the smaller fragments will move more than the larger fragments, enabling the fragments to be sorted by size. By the end of the process, you'd have here DNA with one large fragment, here DNA with two fragments, and here DNA that's been cut into three fragments. How would it be cut? By restriction enzymes. So you use a combination of these techniques to get results like this as you're analyzing DNA. Material related to biotechnology often shows up on the AP Bio exam in this form. Here's a simple restriction mapping problem. A 20 kilobase plasmid, KB kilobase, has several restriction sites. The image on the right shows the results of electrophoresis following various combinations of restriction enzymes. Which lane shows the gel that would result if the plasmid were digested with the restriction enzyme BAM H1. This line over here indicates a restriction site that's been labeled with BAM H1. So there's a restriction site over here for BAM H1, a second one over here, and a third. The entire plasmid is 20 kilobases, and the map is telling you that this is a three kilobase difference. So if you cut the plasmid with BAM H1, you'd wind up with three fragments. Here's one. Here's a second one, it would start here, go all the way down to here, and here's a third one that would start here, go all the way up to here. The first one would be three kilobases in size. The second one would be 11 kilobases in size. How did I do that? Three kilobases plus eight equals 11, and the last one is six kilobases in size. And what that means is that you'd have to look over here at the gel, and you'd see, oh, this fragment is 11 kilobases, this fragment is six kilobases, and this one is three. Perfect, that means B would be your answer if this were on a multiple choice test. What is PCR? What is it used for? PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. The polymerase is DNA polymerase. It's a cell-free technique for cloning DNA. In other words, you can clone DNA in a test tube. You don't need a cell in order to do it. It requires the DNA sample that you wanna clone. It's shown over here at A. It requires primers. Those are short strands of single-stranded DNA that bind to sequences at the start of the DNA that you want to amplify. So here is a primer, and here you see the primer binding to the target DNA. It requires 
heat resistant DNA polymerase shown over here at G. That would be a large protein. Why does it need to be heat resistant? Because the process involves repeated cycles of heating and cooling, and you need a DNA polymerase that won't be denatured by the heating process. Where do you find it? From bacteria and archaea that live in hot springs. And you also need free nucleotides that are going to be used for DNA synthesis, because what we're doing is we're making lots of DNA from a sample that we want to amplify. How does it work? It involves repeated cycles of heating the DNA to separate it into different strands. So here's the DNA. You heat it, you break those hydrogen bonds, and now you've separated it into single strands. That's step one over here. Then you cool the DNA enough so that primers can bind to it and so that DNA polymerase can synthesize new DNA. That's shown at two and it's shown at three. The DNA polymerase will read the template strand and it'll seal uh, sugar phosphate bonds between the nucleotides that bind with the template strands. So here you are, uh, you're seeing DNA polymerase creating new DNA. And every heating and cooling cycle will double the amount of DNA. So we started with one piece of DNA. Now we have two pieces of DNA. That's an exact copy of the original DNA. Do it again. You have four pieces of DNA. Do it again and you'll have eight pieces of DNA. After 10 cycles, you have a thousand times more DNA than you started with. And after 30 cycles, you've amplified your DNA a billion fold. This is widely used in any kind of science that needs to work with DNA. It's widely used in forensics where little DNA samples from a crime scene, for example, are amplified so that they can be analyzed for electrophoresis, DNA fingerprinting, etc. What is DNA sequencing? What are some of its uses? DNA sequencing, you just need to know what it is. You don't really need to know how it's done, though if you're interested in seeing how it's done, you can do that at learn-biology.com. DNA sequencing involves taking a sample of DNA, anything from a small fragment to the entire genome of an organism, and figuring out the specific sequence of A, T, C, and G nucleotides that make it up. It allows biologists to determine what proteins an organism can produce. It's used to infer evolutionary relationships, and it's used by cancer biologists to sequence tumors to see what genetic mutations are causing the cells to become cancerous. During the COVID-19 pandemic, sequencing was used to analyze the emergence of new SARS-CoV-2 variants, and of course it was used in order to create the vaccine. In forensic, sequencing is being used along with DNA fingerprinting to identify and exonerate suspects and resolve paternity disputes. Want to learn more? Sign up for a free trial of the website that guarantees your AP Biology success, learn-biology.com, and watch this next video.